Why should a prominent politician's wife be able to be a judge? It should be, it, it should be against the law. We are, you see somebody that he's, he's I, I laugh at it. He's a prominent politician and his wife climbs up and becomes a Supreme, a Supreme Court Justice. We have to regulate these things. And some people will say, how can you regulate love? You're not regulating love. You're re regulating sanity and discipline. If, you're, if your wife needs to be a judge, then you need not be an elected official. You must pick one. Let us get serious. Let us get serious. You hear court judgment. <laughs> you hear court judgment. And it's been the politicians you see on your television, in the Senate, the National Assembly, are finished products of a very corrupt route. Somehow, you become a governor and you're no longer a Nigerian. Somehow you become a judge, you're no longer a Nigerian. You're a president and you're no longer a Nigerian. And that is the root of the problem. It is a Nigerian problem. If you're a corrupt Nigerian and you're made a judge, you will be a corrupt judge. If you're a corrupt Nigerian and you become a San, you will become a corrupt San. The problem is a Nigerian problem. It starts from the home, it starts from the communities. We don't even hold each other accountable any longer. So, sir, I, I equally have a question for you. Perhaps we should legislate who people marry. Why should a prominent politician's wife be able to be a judge? It should be, it, it should be against the law. We are, you see somebody that he's, he's I, I laugh at it. He's a prominent politician and his wife climbs up and becomes a Supreme, a Supreme Court Justice. We have to regulate these things. And some people will say, how can you regulate love? You're not regulating love, you're re regulating sanity and discipline. If, you're, if your wife needs to be a judge, then you need not be an elected official. You must pick one. Let us get serious. Let us get serious. You hear court judgment. <laughs> you hear court judgment, and it's been it, it, the, the judge sitting there is the wife of a senator, and the senator comes on the floor of the Senate and tells us, Well, in the bedroom, my, I, I have negotiated for some of you, and we laugh. So I'm, I'm calling on all of us because I, I was talking to my friend, Dr. Gash. I was saying to him that the simplistic response to all of our problems is to blame the judiciary. The simplistic solution to all our problems is, is to blame politicians. If I didn't tell you today that I am a politician or I was a politician before I went on sabbatical, I don't look like one. I don't speak like one. But let me tell you another problem before I sit down, having listened to um, our, our uh, speaker. The bigger problem is, I have to humbly tell you that the politicians you see on your television, in the Senate, the National Assembly, are finished products of a very corrupt route. I remember the first time, I was just coming back from the US when I ran for Federal House of Reps. I went to one of the delegates' house, and I must say this with all sense of humility, the man couldn't speak English, was a secondary school dropout, was riddled with poverty. I was trying to understand how can this man gauge if I'm good enough to represent him. I could barely sit on his seat. The house was filthy. All of you politicians know what I'm talking about. But multiple people like him were responsible to vote for who was going to represent them. And then you wonder what is wrong. With all due respect, it's not lawyers that pick these people. It's not. It's not people seated here that choose who is going to represent their parties. Let's get serious. From the root is corrupt. When it's time to pick those delegates, politicians pick delegates who cannot barely understand the system. All they know is the brown envelope. And you let them elect your senators and House of Reps members. And you, what do you expect to get out of it? Let's get serious. When they are writing these delegates, most of them are not even educated. They can't read. They can't write. They don't understand anything. They're waiting for the bags of rice. They don't care about issues. Give me the money. And then finally, 
because maybe this is not the right time to say all of this. But finally, before I sit down, I want to challenge us. Are you waiting for your turn? Because the last election to me was the most sincere. A man who is now, with all due respect, our president, said it is his turn. I felt that was the most sincere statement. Because amongst the political class, amongst the judges, amongst the judiciary, the legislative, all of us are waiting for our turn. Our turn for the, the embarrassingly reality that we are left to cater to ourselves. The very nature of the Nigerian state is what is creating the electoral rot. Every Nigerian is taking care of themselves. So when you are elected, when you're looking for office, you're looking for a means to take care of yourself. Pay school fees, pay for your electricity, pay for water, pay for the road, pay for everything. Even your security you pay for. So tell me, how can you elect me and expect me, who is coming for my own slice of the national cake, to protect yours? The problem is all of us sitting here and those sitting out there. It may be simple to hold the judiciary responsible, but what I hold them responsible for, with all due respect, is before you became a judge, you were a Nigerian. And sir, because you're the governor we're seeing, you were once a governor, and now you are the chairman of the ruling party. Before all of that, you were a Nigerian. Let's think about Nigeria first. Thank you very much. First, let me commend my brother, the Senate advocate, for a great paper. Um, Noni saying was brilliant. There are so many brilliant people, but there are few sincere and honest people. So I, I respect and commend you for the truth. Brilliance is cheap, but honesty is expensive. Thank you very much. Let me say this very clear, and I'm going to respond to three key points. First, in every country, Elections are one of strategy. So in the U.S. today, you see policy people, strategists, thinking around messaging, thinking around mapping constituencies. In Nigeria as well, election is one of strategy. And the strategy of election in Nigeria is very simple. Bribe INEC, bribe judiciary, commandeer the security. And they are done. They the people that destroyed 23 election is INEC and judiciary. The rules were clear. The, son, the electoral act is not perfect, but it was very clear. I, I, I'm surprised that any judge who understands administrative law, which I have taught in the university for years, which I studied under the best in the world, would argue that an entire regulation built on a law, an act, a regulation, Directing that you will do X, you can choose to do Y. When there is legitimate expectation and detrimental reliance, INEC was totally wrong, and the courts, Supreme Court downwards, got it wrong. When an agency created under the law with an enabling act and a constitution that says you can make rules, makes rules. Those rules are law. They can unmake it through rulemaking process. If they don't, they are bound to obey it. Results should have been transmitted electronically. I'm ashamed. I have a PhD in law and I can stand anywhere in the world to dispute the best and brightest. I was ashamed that the court affirmed that I can just walk away from the law. Five years I was a regulator of electricity. When we make tariffs, it's the same way INEC makes rules. We make those laws, tariffs, they are legal instruments. They are binding the law. I hold INEC responsible, and I hold the courts responsible for the failure of the elections. <laughs> Sir, it's important to clarify who can sue. Here is the point. Electoral jurisprudence, the problem with Nigerian elections is that they don't understand electoral jurisprudence. Electoral jurisprudence is that the court's job is to restore back power to the people voting. Democracy is not...
The dispute is not between Mr. Amade and Mr. Kutipupa. No. It's about the people's right to elect their leader. Therefore, we shouldn't be saying that only persons who contested and who could have won could file an electoral petition. No. Citizens who voted have a right to go to court and say that the, the, the process was faulty. Look at the U.S. jurisprudence. All the cases that went to court in 2022, in 2020, I guess, we are mostly by civil society groups and voters. That should change. Now, what does it take to nullify election? I always wonder why judges feel that what they call substantive justice, substantive compliance. If elections were conducted outside the rules, that is enough to nullify the election. You don't have to prove that you would have won. Elections should be nullified if they are conducted contrary to rules. Our jurisprudence is 40 on that. So the question then is, there's a key, a key point somebody mentioned about too much burden on the, on the judges. It is caused by INEC, and I make this clear. The new Electoral Act provides two safeties that we destroyed. First, internal democracy. It says that all candidates must be either elected directly or indirectly. If you choose indirect, then it laid out democratically elected. Let me say it clear. The court has a right and a duty to overrule parties if they present candidates they did not go through their rules of the constitution and their own internal rules. There's no justice like saying, look, there are three people here. Members of the party have a right to due process. That's why the act provides for it. And that's the constitution provides for it. So if you do not second guess politicians, then you are, it's not that you are imposing the candidate, you know, you are requiring them to follow the rules. And that's what the Supreme Court has been saying before. And the final point I want to make is very clear on this. INEC needs to start doing administrative adjudication. Now, let's be very clear. Every process in an election, including rulemaking, including the kind of results, are administrative procedures that require due process. Meaning that INEC should be sitting and making rulings on objections during collection of election. I watch the drama where INEC says, call result, you call result, after I go to court. No, that's not the way. That is an intermediate procedure before adjudication in court. That is administrative hearing. You must establish the validity of those results through a process that INEC cannot make rules, which the court will now review through judicial review. So the critical point is here, and I want to end on this note. The Amity case you mentioned, sir, interesting case. The court did something that was nice, but look at the failure. The issue is, it's not for the court to impose candidates. Courts can verify result and ask people to elect to go back. So we have to redraft timelines to allow for repeat elections, not imposition. And the key point here then is that this is not a matter of nicety. I like the point you made. Politicians are mad dogs. You need to police them. But when the policer of mad dog is himself mad, then that's confusion. The judiciary should no longer be thinking of politicians as people who want to do public good. The public interest is to impose order and regularity in politics, not to allow politicians to self-regulate. That is a lesson of history. I don't blame politicians. I blame judiciary. I blame INEC because they abandon their work and politicians are the ones who can never see power and leave power. You have to treat them as persons who have adverse interest to public interest and force to regulation the convergence of private and public interest. Thank you.